How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. Thank you. Where are you? We've got a day off today in Medford, Oregon. We're kind of in transition between Portland, where we played last night, and tomorrow night we'll be in San Francisco. Travel, travel. Not a bad life, though. Oh, man. You know, we're built for this. We've all been doing it a long time. And, uh, I mean, we've been doing it a long time now as Black Star Riders, as crazy as that sounds. You know, it's hard to believe we we're five years into this thing. But, uh, you know, we love the music and we love each other. And it's just a, it's a pretty special band, we feel. Well, before we get into some questions, I got to say, I saw you guys in Ottawa when you were opening for Judas Priest and Saxon. Fantastic show, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, it was really fun. I enjoyed that. Is it tough being on a being the first on a on a three band bill? No, you know it's a great opportunity for us. You know, we we know it's it just puts a lot of eyes and ears on our band, and in if you if you really look at it for what it truly is, it's a brand new band. North America is just almost totally unaware of, of Black Star Riders, who it is, what it is, what it sounds like. So to get an opportunity to get in front of that many people on a nightly basis, you know, we cherish that, man. We, we, uh, I don't know that we could really get a better opportunity than this, to be honest with you. You know, short of doing stadiums with the Rolling Stones or something, it would just be more people. <laughs> but I don't think we could get any more passionate hard rock and and you know music fans then we're getting on this tour so it's not tough at all we love it we embrace it why are you not known in america or Canada? because there are no it's a really easy answer brother there are just no platforms anymore for a potential a potential fan to discover a band like black star riders um you know there's a lot of things that are great about the new business model of the music business in general, but you can't just completely point blame at the record companies. They certainly served the purpose of investing in a new band and giving them proper promotion, working their songs at radio, working their songs in the press, seeking opportunities to get their music in film and television and adverts and things like that. That just doesn't exist anymore. And it's, you know, it's not coming back. If you're a pop artist, you know, you just got to be great. And if you're great, there's, there's tons of people out there to, uh, to embrace it. And there are still avenues for you to plug into those people. But uh, certainly in North America, those platforms do not exist anymore. But they do have them over in, in England. Yeah, there's, there's definitely more. I mean, you know, we're so fortunate, Black Star Writers in the UK, because for reasons that I can't truly explain, <laughs> we've... Uh, We've been embraced by BBC Radio 2 over there. And, you know, we've had some late night beer soaked debates on the tour bus about what that is. Because I would argue if it weren't for that radio support that we're getting in the United Kingdom, there's a chance that we would have never even gotten Black Star Riders off the ground. And, you know, there's a chance that Scott and Ricky and myself would have just scurried back to being Thin Lizzy and, and, you know, being a tribute band and playing the hits uh, for a few tours every year. But we certainly weren't passionate about that. We're proud of it and we're grateful for it. But, you know, Scott's been playing those songs for the better part of four decades now. And, you know, for him to take the leap of faith that he did and want to try and be a part of something new, create some new music with guitars and, and story lyrics and, you know, to see what we could do. Uh, I guess I feel like it's kind of the universe rewarding us with, with a lot of the, the broader support that we have in Europe and, and in the United Kingdom specifically. Yeah, the last album went to number six, I read. Yeah, we debuted at number six on the charts and not an insignificant accomplishment. I know that physical is physical copies are, are pretty much non-existent and the day is coming when you won't even be able to get compact discs anymore. And it's just all going to be streaming, and uh, and that's okay. You know, we feel like we're we're trying to educate our fans as best we can, and we're definitely growing a broader fan base little by little. The more we continue to tour, and as we go from one record to the next, so 
without a doubt, we're proud of the progress and proud of the growth. Um, yes, I wish it was faster. I wish it was bigger. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we're certainly accomplishing a lot, and that's not that's not lost on us. We're, we're proud of that. Well, you said something there that made me kind of sad, that the CD is going to be disappearing soon. I remember, you know, well, let's talk about Judas Priest. Uh, when I was young, picking up a Judas Priest album was an event. You would sit and study the lyrics and study the thank you, the, the liners. You know, that just doesn't happen anymore. It just seems to be gone. There's not that passion anymore from fans. Well, that that type of discovery is indeed gone. And, you know, the youth of today will never experience that. But they're fine with that. You know, they're fine with experiencing and discovering music their way and in their time. And I think for guys your age and my age, we were naive to think that it would be like it was in our youth and in our 20s and 30s, that it would just be like that forever. There was no reason to believe otherwise, you know. But obviously a lot changed with the growth of the internet, uh, with the growth of MP3s, digital downloads, um, and now the streaming services. And I mean, I kind of equate it to a great comparison that my wife came up with. She says, you know, Damon, it's like when people used to make their living selling whale blubber. There were lots of people making lots of money selling whale blubber. And then someone created kerosene. And all the whale blubber guys were out of business forever. They either had to downsize, and if they were passionate about, you know, harvesting whale blubber, they had to find <laughs> some other use for it, or they had to find something else to do and get passionate about. And that's where we're at with it, bro. You know, we love this music, and we are so happy that there are enough fans out there that we can still do this for a living. We can still do it full time. Um, I don't know. I, I myself am just committed to trying to operate in reality as much as possible. No cynicism, no pessimism. But if you're going to ask me, if the, uh, the guys in the, in the band know it, if they want, if they want to know how it really is, they're going to get the truth from me. I'm not going to pretend that, you know, we're going to put out our fourth record next year and all of a sudden, 200,000 people are going to buy CDs. It's just, it's not, it's not going to happen. That ship has sailed. Yeah, still kind of sad. Let's get on to more uh, positive things here. I went to Setlist FM and checked out your uh, your tour dates. The night before you played in Ottawa, you played a theater show in Montreal. Yeah. I know that's not part of the, the big tour. Do you do that quite often? Just kind of get out on your own and do your own show? Oh, we do it whenever we can. At every possible opportunity, we absolutely do. Uh, we just played a show on our own in Seattle night before last. And uh, we've got one coming up in Phoenix in a couple of weeks, right before the end of the whole tour. We just feel like that if we've got everyone together, we're on the bus, we've got the gear. You know, if we've got any other holes in the calendar that we can fill and get in front of some people, uh, we want to try and take advantage of that. We're at a little bit of a disadvantage because we all live in different cities. In Scott's case, in a completely different country because he's lived in England since the 70s. Right. So, you know, to get everyone kind of corralled together, and our road crew and, and all of that, we just, we want to take advantage of that time. And I have to give a lot of credit to Ricky. Um, he, he's got, it comes from a strong working man's background and he is relentless about wanting to, to work as much as we can. So as long as his voice holds out and, you know, he's delivering the goods at the level that he absolutely does from night to night, you know, we, we're, we're going to play whenever we can. So we, we had a great show in Montreal that night. That, that was one of my favorite favorite nights of the whole tour. It was really special. That's fantastic. What's, what's the difference between preparing for an arena show and a, and a theater show or a, a club show? Is there anything different when you, not just the band, but for you personally, um, that you have to get ready for? You know, that's a good question. I guess really there's no differences uh, beyond the fact that if you're on the arena show, You've got a shorter amount of time, and you want to you want to cram as much music into that as possible. So we're a lot more thoughtful about the pace of the set, the running order of the songs, and you know, 
trying to pick eight or nine songs that best represent the band in front of people that have never heard us. If we're playing on our own in a, in a smaller venue, generally there's a lot of people that are going to know who we are, and we can we can take the show a little more at our own pace, so we can interact more with the audience and talk some more, and and uh, not have to race from one song to the next. Yeah, it is kind of a marathon eh, when you're opening up because you do have to get as much as you can out there. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we're proud of the three albums where we, uh, we've got a lot of stuff to choose from. And, um, you know, it's fun too, because we, we've become so close with all the guys in Judas Priest and Saxon. So, you know, they're checking it out and giving us some, some honest feedback. And I don't know, it's just been an incredible tour. Um, one of the favorites of my whole career. For, for several reasons, not the least of which is everyone gets on so great. So, uh, yeah, man, we love those 40 minute sets, and uh, but we, you know, we certainly love playing our own, more of our own stuff as well, like we did in Montreal and Seattle. I interviewed Richie Faulkner before the Ottawa show. He mentioned that Thin Lizzy was one of the founding fathers of the harmony guitar solos, and used it quite a bit in BSR. I noticed as well. Um, can you kind of talk a little bit about Scott's influence on you as a player and, you know, what it's like to be in a band with someone who inspired you so much? <laughs> I love talking about that. Uh, for anyone that has followed my career or read interviews that I've given through, throughout my career, you know, Finn Lizzie was pretty much always the first name I would list when asked about my influences and not just guitar wise but songwriting phil's lyrics his phrasing um just poetry just pure art man some of the stuff that guy created so it was such a tremendous influence for me and sometimes i feel like i've had two waves of careers you know in the beginning i started out 100 percent focused on the guitar period and putting bands together and starting to write riffs and arrangements and things like that. But then when I shifted into putting Brother Kane together in the 90s and I was the singer as well, it was like a total 180. You know, everything in my head and my thought process was about songwriting and storytelling and lyric writing. So the guitar playing, I usually didn't really think about until the last part of the recording process. That part was easy for me. So, um, Move forward ten years, and I and I started playing uh, with Alice Cooper. You know, I got back into really practicing more and kind of revisiting the influences of my youth. And then Lizzie was a huge slice of that. So it's still in, indescribable that feeling of getting a phone call from Scott's management that there was a spot open in Thin Lizzie, and that my name was on a very short list, and they wanted to see if I was interested and available. And, um, you know, it was just one of the great events of my life. And, you know, Scott has been so gracious and inclusive and supportive and just encouraging. You know, he, he loves my playing. He knows how much respect I have for him and his legacy and the band's legacy. So I still get kind of giddy like a teenager, honestly, brother, when we're in the studio working up guitar parts and, you know, we try to sprinkle several moments throughout the course of a 10 song record where there is some harmony events and, you know, just those melodic statements that we hope people can sort of sing along with in their head, just like they can a lyric or, a, you know, a chorus vocal melody. And uh, I, I feel like Scott Gorham kind of owns some of that real estate in guitar history. He truly does. Uh, Richie is, is absolutely correct to, to say that about Ben Lizzie, but you'll never find a more humble person than Scott about the whole thing. Uh, he kind of sarcastically always says, Hey man, I'm just the guy on the left, um, you know, stage left to the right for the fans. But, uh, he's, he's done so much more than that. And he's meant so much to me. I, I still play along with those records to this day. Uh, I was in the dressing room a couple of nights ago and I revisited Scott's, amazing solo to a song called Romeo and the Lonely Girl off of the Jailbreak album. 
And he just laughs. He's like, wow, man, you play that better than I did. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't you know, think so, brother. I was in a a cover band in uh, Korea when I lived in Korea. And uh, we started every show with the boys are back in town. Just that, that little harmony part, the da 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 I mean, it was just so much fun to play. And, I mean, if you can't appreciate that, then what can you appreciate, you know? It's, it's in the top ten classic rock songs of all time. And I'll argue that to my grave. I'll put my boots on Jimmy Page's dining room table and argue with him about that anytime. Whenever I play acoustically, solo acoustic, um, I, I always love playing the boards of back in town. And what I do is I get the audience to sing that guitar melody that you're talking about. They sing it back to me. And uh, it's just a timeless little piece of music, you know, so great, so great. You know, I also read on Wikipedia that you recorded an album with Dan Yankees that was never released. Now, you know, you were talking about Thin Lizzy as being your your inspiration for songwriting. Styx was always my, my biggest influence for songwriting when I was a kid. What happened with that album? You know, it just never really fully materialized. Um, a lot of fun for me to spend, spend a, a decent amount of time with those guys to be creative with them uh to to be in the songwriting capacity uh certainly the recording studio but we never got it far enough off the ground to really even perform any shows together uh, i had known ted a long time since back in the early 90s he was so outspokenly supportive of brother kane he loved our band and we had done a few dates together and we all had in common a relationship with the legendary A&R man, John Kalodner. And even though I never recorded on a label that John was a part of, uh, he had always connected kind of with what I was doing and was just a fan of my, my writing and, and my skills. So Tommy was needing to focus on sticks. He had just kind of acquired, he and JY had acquired the rights to the name Sticks after Dennis DeYoung had left the band. And um, and this was right when they had committed to do an album for Columbia Records, you know, Jack and Ted and Tommy. So Tommy gave the band his blessing to, you know, seek out someone else to step in so that they could move forward and, and make that record. And um, so Kaladner reached out to me and introduced me to Jack and, you know, the whole thing kind of came together quickly. I just, I had nothing else going on at that time. I was, I was writing some and uh, about to, my fiance and I were getting ready to get married. And I, I just wasn't really a part of a full-time band at that time. So that came out of nowhere. And um, I had a great time, you know, I don't know that the songs really were to the quality that we had all hoped they would be. And, and ultimately that material is, is, you know, it's their band. It's Tommy and, and Jack and, and Ted's band. And I don't know if that stuff's ever going to see the light of day, but it's a, it's a little piece of rock and roll folklore now that I'm, <laughs> it's fun to be a part of it. You know, I, I tell everybody, they go, Hey, weren't you in the damn Yankees? I go, yeah, I was in the damn Yankees for about 15 minutes. It was awesome. <laughs> well, good on you. I mean, that's a, that's a great lineup. Well, a lot of talent right there for sure, man. A lot of talent and a lot of history. Um, music history in in all those guys and had a lot of laughs man got some great stories out of it it was fun let me ask you a question this is kind of a weird one but you've played with a lot of big names do you ever get really nervous when you're up on stage with somebody that you're not used to playing with well i, I was i was nervous for sure when i did a show with jeff beck one night in las vegas i performed a show with steven tyler who i've known for a long time steven put a kind of a, an all-star band together to play four songs for the iHeart Radio Festival. This was in, I believe, October of 2011. And Jeff Beck was on lead guitar. And uh, Jeff is arguably the greatest of all time. Of all time. There is none greater than Jeff. So that first day of rehearsal was, was definitely, uh, I, I found myself kind of, watching every word I said and every move I made and just trying to stay out of the way because he's really special. And to man, he put my, 
put my mind at ease quickly and was was really uh, just said some great things about my playing and you know was was uh, was really gracious with with the whole experience. But uh, he was he was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty intense. And the first time I was in a songwriting <clears throat> setting with Alice Cooper, it took me a second to you know not be a fan. We had already played about six weeks worth of shows together, just performing concerts. But, you know, to sit in a room, me and Les Paul and Alice with a pen and a notebook paper, that was incredible. Incredible. And, uh, you know, I had so much fun, man, bouncing ideas off of him. He's so fast and just, again, pure art, man. He just, he's fearless. And such a great experience for me to work with guys like that. It's made me a better writer, for sure. It's certainly given me more confidence and, and uh, just helped me clear more of a path in whatever creative setting I've been a part of since then. I'm grateful for that. Wow. Yeah, Alice Cooper's the man. He's the man. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him years ago, and it just blew my mind. Actually, what year did you play with him? I played lead guitar for Alice in the end of 2004 all of 05 and 06. And then I did one of my own projects for a couple of years and then came back to 09 and 2011 up until I got the phone call. Yeah, I wouldn't have seen you then. He's had a he's had a lot of great guitars, man. Alice has had so many talented people in his bands, you know. And it's a real testament <clears throat> to his his catalog and his legacy and just the thing that he does so special that no one else can emulate. He's one of a kind. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to ask you, uh, I've, I've got a new little segment on my website. What I do is I get my, uh, my daughters to write questions for people I'm interviewing and they've never heard of you and they don't listen to rock music, but. Uh, That's just, awesome. <laughs> that is just, awesome. So they came up with some questions that they, they wanted to ask you. Hopefully nothing is too childish, but who cares, right? It's just, it's all good. Hey, bro, um, you're talking you're, talk, you're talking to a father of five. There's nothing you will ask me that can rattle me, I assure you. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I was sitting with uh, Richie Cotton the other day and uh, doing an interview with him, and he's the first person I did this with. And my first question to him was, who's your favorite Disney princess? And I was really embarrassed to ask it, <laughs> and he just, no problem. Answered it straight up. That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So here's here's one. Uh, here's a couple for you. What's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you on the stage? The most embarrassing thing that has ever happened to me on the stage, I have to go all the way back to 1986. I had been hired by my first professional band, you know, that was going out and playing the club circuit in the Southeast. Uh, I grew up in Alabama and have lived there most of my life, but we had been booked to this pretty famous beach bar down in Fort Walton, Florida called the Hogs Breath Saloon. And I fancied myself to be the Eddie Van Halen razzle dazzle MTV flashy guitar player, you know. And the Hodge Breath had this wooden petition in front of the stage. Not not a barrier really, but just a little just kind of a little thing to separate the band from the tables where people would eat and drink and, and, and that whole kind of thing. And uh so we were playing our Van Halen medley, not ironically, and uh I jumped up on that wooden petition in my fancy capizios that I had bought at probably Chess King at the mall so I could try and look cool like Randy Rhodes. And I proceeded to completely wipe out and fall off of that barrier into the drum kit. And I just wish to this day that, you know, things like social media and, and cell phones existed back then and that someone had have caught that on video because as embarrassing as it was, it was truly one of the great wipeouts of all time, of all time. And uh, I guess the good news is that if I got it, getting that one out of the way, there, there was nothing else that's happened since then that could rise to that level of embarrassment. So <laughs> I've, I've been pretty unscathed since then. 
Nice. That's a good one. That's a very spinal tap moment. Oh, beyond, beyond. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Question two from the daughters. Uh, what kind of car do you drive? I drive a 2004 GMC Yukon XL, meaning it's the extended, you know, the extended area in the back. And I have, I'm in love with that truck. And it's starting to kind of drive my wife crazy. She would like for me to get rid of it. It's kind of that boring beige color, but it's got a big, uh, you know, big trailer hitch on it. So I can, I can uh, do tour dates around the Southeast with my own band, my solo band. I can fit all the drums, all the gear, everything in that and, and uh, make our way around. And uh, yeah, it's pretty boring. Not very rock and roll, but there's nothing I can't I can't haul or tow in that thing. So, uh, yeah, that's what I drive. Okay. Uh, what's the last movie you saw? The last movie I saw. The last movie I saw was Lady Bird. Wow, that's kind of embarrassing because that's been about that's been about two months ago. You know, I don't watch. I'm not the guy that really is like deep into Netflix and that kind of stuff on the road. I'll watch bits and pieces of things, but I've been trying to catch up on some songwriting and some reading on this tour. But Lady Bird was the last movie I saw in the theater. Here's another one I asked uh, Richie Cotton last week, and my daughter always gets mad at me because I have so many guitars in the house. How many guitars do you have, and why do you need so many? I have about 25, and I don't need so many. I just don't. I just love them. Uh, you know, many of them, <clears throat> I, I'm not one that, that trades or sells guitars, really. Like, if I acquire one, I hang on to it and I, I use it. I guess maybe I covet them a little bit, you know. Um, I have way too many Gibson Les Pauls. Um, literally had the conversation with the wife before this tour. She's like, when you get home, you've got to get rid of some of those. Because, they're, you know, they're pretty expensive now. They, they've they've increased so much in value. And uh, my son is, is a teenager. He's playing hockey. That's expensive. My daughter's playing basketball. You know, we've got other things we want to do. And man, I could sell a couple of those guitars and pay for a couple of seasons of, of hockey. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yes, I, I own about 25 guitars. Okay. And I might as well ask you since uh, I started off with this, but, uh, let's wrap it up with this. Who is your favorite Disney princess? My favorite Disney princess is Ariel from The Little Mermaid. My oldest daughter, Heather, was obsessed with that when she was a, a, a kid. And, you know, this would go back into like late 80s, early 90s that uh, she was just obsessed with that. And now she's an adult. She's a, a school teacher and a, a guidance counselor at a high school. Uh, she still loves Ariel and the Little Mermaid. So I have two other daughters younger than her, and it's kind of a rite of passage for them that, you know, when they were of age, they too were completely immersed in the Little Mermaid. So no contest, it's Ariel. Right on. Well, listen, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for the great questions, brother. I've enjoyed this, man. Thank you. Sorry to get uh, sorry if I got a little too rea realistic about the state of the music business, but uh, you know, man, I'm I'm so proud as I'm sure you are to have grown up at the time that we did and and have the musical experiences that we have, and it's so fantastic to have you know Judas Priest on the road right now. We can all go out and 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 watch him perform and and see Rob sing and watch Ian Hill on the bass and even Glenn, you know, even Tipton is showing up and making a few surprise appearances in the encore on some of the shows, man, that music was such a part of my youth as well. So, um, long live the priest. Absolutely. I think if it wasn't for Eddie Van Halen and Glenn Tipton, I never would have touched the guitar. A lot, a lot of people echo that exact sentiment, my friend. I'm one of them. Yeah. He's, he's a beast. I absolutely love him. He's a beast. I, I was so disappointed. Well, I guess not disappointed, but a little bummed out that he, uh, he played the the show before Ottawa, but he didn't play in in Ottawa. So yeah, it's sad, man. You know, it's so dependent on on his health and 
and his and his energy level and, and availability. But uh, it's really special when he when he's there. He he, he came back out and, and made an appearance in uh, in Kent, Washington, and then he was there in Portland last night. It was fantastic. That's unreal. Well, listen, I'm going to let you go. Um, good luck with the the rest of the tour, and hopefully, we'll get some new uh, some new music soon. Will indeed. Thank you so much, brother. Right on. Take care of yourself.